It's World Localization Day. We're living in a very interesting period. I'm really happy to be asked to speak on this World Localization Day. Hello from London. I'm Tandy Newton, and I'm wishing you a happy World Localization Day. My best wishes for World Localization Day. Happy Localization Day. Happy World Localization Day. We live in communities and we must help each other in communities. And I'm thrilled to be with you today on World Localization Day. Happy World Localization Day from Russia. Be accountable to our bioregions and that that would be the most meaningful thing we could do. Local is our future. We have to buy local. We have to buy local food from local farmers. We need to build a worldwide movement for local economies. Happy Localization Day. We're not separate from the cosmos. We're not separate from nature. We need a new political story. The future will be more local. I'm Helena Norberg Hodge director of the international nonprofit Local Futures. We put together this event to celebrate the emerging worldwide localization movement and to strengthen it by encouraging more international collaboration. The COVID pandemic has made it clear just how fragile and unreliable the global economic system is and it's heightened awareness about the vital need for community and greater self-reliance. Localization isn't about ending international trade. It is about shortening the distances between production and consumption wherever possible. It's about bringing the economy closer to home so that we can more clearly see the impact of our actions. It's a simple concept with far-reaching benefits. It can help restore more meaningful, more reliable livelihoods while greatly reducing our impact on the biosphere. And it restores our fundamental connections to one another and to the Earth. It's truly a win-win-win solution. Over the coming hours, you're going to hear from friends and colleagues of ours from every continent, from economists, from politicians, farmers, artists, and activists. I hope the stories they tell will inspire you to believe that a more equitable, a healthier, a kinder, gentler world is not just some pipe dream. It's within our grasp. What do we all care about, really care about? We all want time for friends and family, a world in which everyone has enough to eat and a roof over their head, clean air, clean water, a stable climate. That's what we want. But what are we actually getting? The fact is, most of the things we truly care about are further away than ever. So what's gone wrong? In a word, the economy more specifically, the global economy. In the global economy, our taxes subsidize corporate giants while killing off local businesses. There's more CO2, fewer jobs, and less democracy. All of this works for multinational banks and corporations, but it doesn't work for people and the planet. Time for a deep breath. Time to clear our heads of all the mumbo-jumbo of economists, politicians, and other so-called experts. Time to think an unthinkably simple thought. If the problem is globalization, how about heading in exactly the opposite direction and supporting local communities and economies instead? Whichever way you look at it, localization is a winner. It reduces inequality, it cuts down pollution, it provides more and better jobs. It connects us with life and with each other. And yes, it even helps to tackle climate change. Better still, it's already happening. So what can we do to help things along? 
First, join the movement to say no to the trade treaties that hand over ever more power to global banks and corporations. Second, put pressure on policymakers to level the economic playing field by insisting that the taxes, subsidies and regulations that currently favor the big and global are shifted instead towards the smaller and the local. Third, join with community groups that are rebuilding the economy from the ground up. Going local, for a world in need of change. Everybody knows that we are living in unusual times and that opens the door to rethink everything. I think that if we are going to move as a society in the direction of localization, it's not going to be because COVID-19 forces us to. It's going to be because it is showing us where we've been headed and therefore asking us, do we really want to keep going in that direction? We've got to begin localizing our politics, localizing our economies, localizing our cultures, localizing our spirits, you know, even our spiritual natures. It seems to me that the coronavirus has given us one last chance. This moment of pause that we have is unique. It is an, an opportunity that absolutely must not be missed. We must use it to prepare a different kind of reset. If we do not, we are squandering what is, I believe, almost certainly our last chance. And the reason why, the fundamental reason why we really have a chance now, I think, that we didn't have before, is that this pandemic is giving us an experience of shared vulnerability. It's giving us around the world an experience of shared vulnerability, shared openness to mortality, if not for ourselves, then at least for our parents or grandparents, shared emergency. We like to think of the transition movement as being a movement of communities who are reimagining and rebuilding the world, and they do so with a particular focus uh, on localization. I feel that this is a time for localization. This is a time for the kinds of um, intimacies and spiritualities and agencies and activisms or post-activisms that might bring us closer um, to the world that has been denied us by a factory cookie-cutter shape or cookie-cutter model um, that denies us our agency, that denies us and denies the planet and ecologies that we depend upon their vibrancy and abundance. We need to come back to a human scale. A human scale means doing things with our hands, means understanding what are we capable to do with our bodies, with our souls, knowing who really, we really are. When we treat economies and communities as local as opposed to global, we have a chance to exercise real power over the way our lives are run. We're talking about I suppose, at least from my, suspect, uh, from my perspective, I'm no Helena norberg Hodge, so I'm no expert, but the way I understand this is if a community can be self-sustaining, fully autonomous, taking care of its own needs as a priority, trading with other communities in confederacy, in alliance, in support and in respect, but when it comes to food, when it comes to the way that we organize power, when it comes to the way we organize health, and even I would say issues as um, potentially complex as justice. We need to localize where possible. Who benefits from globalization? Who benefits from centralization? Obviously, an elite cadre of powerful institutions and organizations. <laughs> More than one in ten of black and Latino families are hungry in this country. That's three times the rate for white households. Our people are five times more likely to die from poor diets than from violence. This is no accident. Currently our food system is in the control of a small number of massive corporations, which are beholden to private profit, not public good. 
one of the reasons that we farm is we want healthy food to get to our community so that we can live healthy lives. Like even ADHD and a lot of learning disabilities are diet related. And so if we want our people to be able to learn, to live long lives, to be healthy, to be strong, we need good food. In a way, Helena, do you see this as a kind of a global opportunity for us to instantiate different systems? And what do those systems look like? Does it mean that we're growing our own food individually? There's already a demonstration of what we need to do. And what that is, is first of all, start building the interdependent human scale local economy. And let's remember, which our leaders do not, and I mean our political and economic leaders, that there's nothing more important that we produce as human beings than food. Right. You know, water we don't produce, and we think we do sometimes, but you know, food is also the activity that most of the human race evolved with in production, in harvesting, in processing. It's in our DNA, and it's also a reason why people respond so amazingly well to the farmer's market, to the amazing, smaller, more diversified farms that are demonstrating that you can, in just a few years, produce vastly more by diversifying. It's not everyone growing food in their back garden. It's about restoring a balance between city and country and allowing more smaller towns and even villages to survive. Se pravi prišli smo do meni, kako se bo treba resnično odločiti, v katero smer bomo šli, govorim v imenu človeštva, ali v smer, ki je človeku dana, torej k obdelovanju zemlje, k samoskrbi, k prevzemanju odgovornosti za naša lastna življenja, česar dan danes pač v izobraževalnem sistemu ne dobimo, ali pa v smer, ki nam je ponujena, torej v globalistično, kapitalistično družbo, ki nas vse izkorišča v imenu kapitala. being poured into continuing business as usual. Whether that's subsidizing fossil fuels, whether it's subsidizing huge monocultures, whether it's giving corporate welfare to some of the already largest and most powerful corporations around. One of the things that neoliberalism wants to get out of the way is democracy. One of the ways they've done so is to shift power out of democratic forums like parliaments into bodies that we can't control, be it the International Monetary Fund or the European Central Bank or offshore trade tribunals, um, where power has, has moved away from us. It's no longer subject to democratic constraints. The market model of big yeah. corporations yeah. like Monsanto and McDonald's is artificially bolstered and supported by taxpayers' money. That's right. Oh, so it's not like it's capitalism I thought was the survival of the fittest. They set up a better economic yeah. model, they sell cheap food reasonably, and therefore they succeed. But no, no, tax money is used to support these corporations, and trade agreements are set up that are advantageous to them and prevent localised cultures emerging. That's right. That's an important piece of information. Every child on this planet, everybody deserves to have fresh, healthy food and local How food. How can that happen? In, if you had any kind of a semblance of a true free market, ah. of course food from five miles away is going to be cheaper oh, than yeah. food from 10,000 miles away. A series of treaties, new ones almost every year, promote economic growth through international trade. As a consequence, countries today routinely import and export nearly identical quantities of identical products. Every day of the year, grain, meat, live animals, canned goods, and a whole range of manufactured products, not to mention waste, even used batteries, crisscross the planet. All of this at a time when rising CO2 emissions 
are threatening our very survival. The commons and localization are not fated to be small or you know, uninfluential because they're small. The strategy is to emulate and federate, to federate horizontally so we can coordinate and trade knowledge and grow a bigger footprint while keeping the appropriate scale. We could say a lot more, but these are some thoughts to consider as we try to imagine a more localized post-pandemic world. Communalism, or horizontal governance, is the idea that democracy works best when citizens make decisions together on the local level in assemblies. They meet face-to-face -face with their neighbors and discuss issues of importance to their communities. They send recallable delegates to councils to make regional decisions, but power always resides at the local level rather than with the nation-state. People could reclaim and redefine politics as something we do for ourselves rather than just voting for someone and hoping for the best. Communalism also envisions a moral economy in which people make collective decisions about how to use natural resources for economic production with the ecological impact in mind. The Economy for the Common Good movement has developed participatory processes on the local level in which the citizens could design the economic, trade and financial system of tomorrow. In Germany, the first local assemblies have already started and we hope them to spread to other countries. Studien aus der Hirnforschung zeigen, dass Konkurrenz nicht die effektivste Motivation ist, sondern ein solidarisches und freundschaftliches Umfeld. Ehrlichkeit, Vertrauen und Wertschätzung sind die Grundlage menschlicher Beziehungen. In einer Gemeinwohlökonomie würden in der Wirtschaft dieselben Werte und Verhaltensweisen zum Erfolg führen, wie in privaten Beziehungen. Il est donc peu probable que la pandémie suffise à vaincre l'inertie d'un système qui combine les intérêts des puissants et la complicité passive de ses victimes, à moins d'un puissant sursaut, d'un puissant mouvement de la base. Incontestablement, l'embryon d'un tel mouvement en faveur d'une démondialisation, relocalisation, existe. Les initiatives locales alternatives de toute nature émergent de façon récurrente, mais elles auraient besoin d'être protégées du renard libre dans le libre poulailler. We here in Russia greatly believe that when our economy becomes small local and the money will be staying within the community, we all be f the, our economy will be flourishing from this. I believe that in future, um, especially taking into consideration the situation we are experiencing now, uh, globalization will, will end and local economy will thrive. The globalized economic system that dominates the world today was supposed to be about trickle down. What is actually happening is absorb up. This becomes very clear if we look at whom globalization has really benefited during the last 30 years. The share of wealth of the top 10% has gone up and the share of the bottom 90% has gone down. The commons such as uh, forests and water and labor at obscenely low cost all are being exploited by big corporations of the globalized economic system. I think we got fooled by false promises of a good life into giving up localized wisdom, our local wealth and rich community life. The corona pandemic in India has shown how tens of millions of migrant workers are treated by capitalists who run factories and businesses. So what we need is a more sane and humane economic system, a more localized economic system, not only for the world, but within large countries like India. It is clear that localization will not only benefit the bottom 90%, 
but it will also bring down the destruction of our environment. We youngsters must not make the mistakes our parents did. What are the signs of hope for you now? Well, actually, we're living in a very interesting period. The problems we face are worse than they've ever been, but the basis for working on them is better than it's been for a long time. We look out the windows, we see the most extraordinary protests that have ever taken place. And what's more, enormous popular support. Uh, popular support for the protesters today is much higher than it was for Martin Luther King at the peak of his popularity. But the fact is, we do have this confluence of the worst problems humans have ever faced, like the question whether organized human society can survive for another generation or two. It's a very live question now. We have problems like that, and we have also more energy, commitment, and capacity to deal with them than ever before. So it's an amazing moment. As I see it, what's gone unabated is a linear projection or progression in an economic system that has become more and more large scale, more and more competitive, more and more global. And it's this techno-economic machine that's driving the extinction of species, extinction of livelihoods, extinction of identities, and extinction of community. But as we come together at the local community level, we start becoming whole again, we start becoming more empowered. Would you agree with that picture? Not only that, but I think we're seeing it uh, develop in quite remarkable ways right now. So one of the really dramatic consequences of the coronavirus pandemic is the rise all over the world of community-based mutual support groups. At the same time, there's a growth in response to the longer term crisis of neoliberal capitalism, which has been devastating for 40 years. There's a growth of worker-owned enterprises, uh, collectives, things like that are happening all over. A lot of localism, people saying we want to grow our own food, not uh, have industrial uh, the production of meat, industrial or agribusiness, which destroys the soil, we'll do it right here, no big transportation costs, we'll develop our own local systems. Things like that are happening everywhere. A lot of good things happening. We can extend them, we can work for them, there's plenty of opportunities, there's problems of a truly existential character, and we, but we are in a position to deal with them. Not for long, incidentally. Another couple of decades may be too late. I completely agree. And this is why we're trying to insist that we don't shy away from looking at the problems and at the system, which we see primarily as the deregulated global machine of giant monopolies supported by the financial markets, which are now run by algorithms. And we see this machine-like progression and the system is what we need to focus on. And from a global perspective and collaborating internationally. That's perfectly true. We're resisting it. People are resisting it. And that's the important thing. Every year since the end of World War II, one of the big polling firms has asked Americans, are you happy with your life? The number of Americans who say, yes, I'm very happy with my life, the percentage peaks in 1956 and goes slowly but steadily downhill ever since. That's interesting because in that same 50 years, we've gotten immeasurably richer. We have three times as much stuff. Somehow it hasn't worked because that same affluence tends to undermine community. We used to believe naively that the economic growth will bring us 
to happiness. And those who are living in rich north are better off and happier than those who live in the less developed and impoverished south. This basic assumption or belief, um, however, has been proven wrong in many of recent researches. In Japan, for instance, besides the universal environmental uh, crisis and, and uh, climate change related disasters, and uh, ever greater uh, gap between the rich and the poor and between the urban and the, uh, and the rural. 40 million people, that is more than one third of the population, live alone today. More and more people are dying alone. Sense of isolation and the helplessness is epidemic. The pop population uh, of the teen is dropping, but the suicide is increasing. Today, I want you to know one Japanese uh, word, shiawase. Let's pronounce it, shiawase. Uh, this means happiness or well-being. But this word originally signifies uh, togetherness, relatedness, and cooperation, putting work together. And this expresses an old cultural worldview where everything is related. Contrast this with a more than individualistic, competitive, and a typically American notion of the pursuit of happiness. Shiawase is a localized notion that is meaningful in a specific place and, and time, whereas uh, pursuit of happiness is what I call delocalized, abstract, and is independent of a specific space and time, globalized. Uh, black and brown folks in the U.S. and wider than the U.S. have been impacted by the U.S. prison and military industrial complex, and it's really, it's really determined our way of life and a cosmology of punishment and a way of being that's uh, facilitated by um, shame and that capitalism is also generated and facilitated and upheld through shame, which also is about, um, a, from a carceral and punitive culture to me. So I think that moving towards um, or locating like what the medicine of healing or repairing that cosmology would, would require relationship and it requires knowing one another and to not be people who could be dehumanized because you didn't, you didn't have a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like there's something about decentralized efforts that really will help us um, build intimacy, which is what my work with the land is about and is about um, relationship. We have to begin to, to change our conception of wealth so that it includes the totality of all the relationships that actually make us rich so that we can look at any bird or any insect and know its sound and look at any, any plant and know its smell and know what kind of soil it grows in. And, and to know the person who grew our food and who prepared our food, and to sing our own songs again, and to be held in a matrix of stories that tells us who we are. I grew, went to the cities where everything was fast and general and and, and big, you know, go big or don't go at all. And it was all about achieving and getting and, and amounting to something and proving I wasn't that stupid, horrible, um, you know, jackass that my father called me my whole life. All that time, I was under a patrick. I was under the Patrix. I was under the um, pressure and the momentum and the push and the, uh, uh, of a force that was not my own. And eventually I got very, very sick. And I knew at the end of that, I could never live in the city again. 
I moved to the trees. I moved to the country. I, 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 I was in my body and I had to be connected to the earth because when you're in your body, you have to be connected to the earth. And I think what capitalist, racist, patriarchy has done intentionally is remove women, remove men from their bodies. And as once you are removed from your body, they can do whatever they want to you. They can do because you're removed from nature. And when you're removed from nature, you're removed from the source and you're removed from the mother and you're removed from the beginning and you're removed from your heart and you're removed from everything that would guide you or teach you or instruct you or lift you. You're removed from the divine. And so I feel so blessed, you know, um, to be local. One of the heroes of my book is an amazing man named Dr. Sam Everington. So he's a general practitioner in East London. And Sam was really uncomfortable. He's a poor part of East London where I lived for many years. And Sam was really uncomfortable because he had loads of patients coming to him who had just terrible depression and anxiety. And like me, he's not opposed to chemical antidepressants. He thinks they have some role to play. But he could see two things. Firstly, that his patients were depressed and anxious for perfectly understandable reasons in, in the vast majority of cases, like they were really lonely and, 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 or financially insecure. And secondly, he could see that chemical antidepressants gave them a bit of relief, but didn't actually solve the problem for most of them. So one day he had this idea to try something different. A patient came to his practice called Lisa Cunningham, who I got to know later. And Lisa had been shut away in her home with just crippling depression for seven years. She barely left the house. And Sam said to Lisa, don't worry, I'll carry on giving you these drugs. I'd also like you to try something else. I'd like to come and meet a couple of times a week here at the doctor's practice to meet with a group of other depressed and anxious people, not to talk about how bad you feel. I mean, you can do that if you want, but I want you to find something you can do together that would be meaningful. So the first time the group met, Lisa literally vomited with anxiety. It was just so much for her. But there was an area behind the doctor's surgery that was just scrub scrubland. And they started talking, and these are inner city East London people who didn't know anything about gardening, but they were like, we could turn this into a garden. That'd be a nice thing to do. So they started to get books out of the library. They started to watch clips on YouTube about, about gardening. And they started to get their fingers in the soil. They started to learn the rhythms of the seasons. Um, you know, uh, they, 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 they started to reconnect with the natural world. They've been cut off from it for a very long time. There's a lot of evidence that kind of interacting with the natural world is a profoundly healing antidepressant. The way Lisa put it to me, as the garden began to bloom, we began to bloom. In this culture the, and in this economy, the alternative that we're given is uh, a f connectivity on social media. And, you know, if we're all honest with ourselves, we know that that's not real connection. We know that when we're curating images of ourselves online and scrolling through other people's profiles online and through their cu self-curated images, when experiencing the opposite of connection we're experiencing an increase of kind of scared ego an increase of um feeling alone and isolation I first became aware of the vital importance of community and local economies in 1975 when I visited the remote Tibetan region of Ladakh, high in the Indian Himalayas. There I encountered a people who had remained outside the influence of our economic system and they'd been able to develop according to their own values over thousands of years. I learned to speak the language fluently and came to realize that the Ladakhis were the happiest, most joyful people I'd ever met. They were also the most tolerant and peaceful. But then I witnessed how in the name of economic growth and development, the people were pulled away from the land and bombarded with images that romanticized an urban consumer culture. In a few short years, they became dependent on fossil fuels and were forced to compete for artificially scarce jobs. 
the end result, poverty, unemployment, mental illness and pollution, concepts that were virtually unknown in the traditional culture. According to conventional yardsticks, this is progress, this is growth. But Ladakh is no longer a culture of deep well-being. It's a culture struggling to survive in the face of economic pressures over which it has no control. I've been thinking a lot about the GDP and how it has changed us potentially. Do we measure what we value or do we value what we measure? When we look at an object and think about how little we really paid for it, when we think about the real cost, the human cost behind the production of this incredibly useful object, the environmental cost behind this incredibly useful object, we paid too little. Share is an empty shop that has been converted into a library of things. I am one of eight apprentices that have created Share, a library of things. So the Share shop is basically a physical hub for people to lend items to each other. So similar to a library, you can uh, borrow stuff, but it's not just books, but it's also yeah, wire items, tools, leisure, holiday equipment, all of that kind of thing reduces the amount of stuff that we need to have ourselves. So we're buying less things and we are throwing less away. In the future we'd like to do skills workshops, which could be anything from you know a DIY workshop to a sewing workshop. Also want to have a, like a repair space out the back, so you can come to the shop, repair your bike if it's got a puncture, you know, if you've got something else to fix, just to come down. There's such a huge range of possibilities of what this shop could be. Look around. Nearly everything you see is from a country other than your own. It arrived wherever you are by ship. This invisible industry, this backbone of the modern economy, not only carries 90% of world trade, but also produces CO2 emissions nearly equal to that of the fifth largest emitting country. Shipping emissions have grown unchecked and are expected to increase dramatically by 2050 despite gains in fuel efficiency. In order to effectively reduce shipping emissions and keep global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius, they can no longer remain the property of all and must become the property of countries. I've spent many of the last few years traveling to the front lines of climate change, which subsequently led me to various forms of environmental activism. I've been thinking over the last few months about what we can learn from the COVID-19 pandemic to apply to the challenging futures that we all face. I think one of the things this pandemic has reminded us of is our shared sense of uh, vulnerability and fragility in the face of adversity. It has reminded us that nature is in charge. And for that reason, uh, it's highlighted the importance of creating more localized systems in order to strengthen communities and make them more resilient. We know that the climate crisis poses many more threats in the future, threats that far outweigh that of the COVID-19 pandemic. So in order to survive or to thrive, we need a new story, one that prioritizes local economies and strengthens communities, one that improves human health and material well-being whilst reducing pollution and environmental degradation. So for that reason, I'm really proud to be supporting World Localization Day. All the international maritime and air uh, transportation, the emissions from this are not accounted by any country. Just think of all those vessels with all kinds of commodities from China to everywhere, uh, from mining with soy, with oil, with liquefied gas. Those emissions are nobody's emission because one of the key assumptions of the climate policy is that you cannot harm trade. Mostly that trade is essentially to fight climate change. No? 
But for me, the worst is that the entire climate policy is transforming climate itself into a commodity to bring all what, it's what is called natural capital into the market. So you need to commodify carbon, biodiversity, water, ecosystem services. All of those are now part of wild schemes of trade, of offset, of financialization, and of subprimes too. This fits really well to a moment in history where the nation state is broke, there's no more money to finance the public, and then we need to bring corporations in. So this is a key movement to legitimize corporate governance everywhere. It's pretty much what we know as the fourth industrial revolution, the digitalization of the entire productive and financial system. So what people talk about inside the Climate Talks, it's Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, the so-called next generation governance package with smart contracts, with drones, with satellites, with blockchains, with sensors everywhere. And how you make all the countries buy this apparatus, this gigantic apparatus of surveillance and control. You, can ha you have to monitor carbon. And the only way to monitor something that you cannot touch, you cannot smell, you cannot feel, is through digital governance. When we learn to see the world through the lens and to the measure of carbon, we are excluding and systematically eradicating from the face of Earth all different kinds of knowledge that could help us in this crucial moment to, to go through this, in this crisis and find a different future for us. But the traditional knowledge and the way our mind has been shaping and how this is retro-shaping our mind all the day, is a key dimension that we need to address. One thing one could say about the difference between the hemispheres is that the left hemisphere is the one that helps us manipulate. And so it's really only interested in how to get hold of things and use them, and sees the world as an array of, of items, of things that can be used. Whereas the right hemisphere sees a much more complex picture in which we see ourselves always as connected ultimately to everything else, not somehow in here and it all out there for us to get, but that we are part of nature, we emerge from nature, we return to nature. And once you see that division is actually embraced by union, union cannot be embraced by division, they're not equal symmetrical partners, um, as incidentally, neither of the hemispheres. The right hemisphere understands the need of what the left does, which is much more detail focused. But because the left hemisphere is narrower or more detail focused in its view, it can't see the importance of the big picture. So mm. they're not symmetrical mm. and neither are division and union, but we need both. Gaia theory tells us something very important about localization, because most species on the planet are deeply local. Like these plants, for example, okay, they move in the wind, but they're not moving from place to place. Most of the organisms on the planet stay within a reasonably small area. They don't move very far. There are some migratory ones, of course, but they're, they're in the minority. And yet, when all these local species around the entire planet interact with each other and with their local rocks and their local atmosphere and their local water, what happens on a global scale is you get the most amazing emergence of planetary self-regulation. So the whole planet becomes one great living organism which can regulate her temperature, her acidity and distribution of key elements. So the message is for us that if we develop local human economies that mimic Gaian ecosystems by being very local, and if these local economies are connected with each other through information exchange and maybe some cultural exchange, then perhaps we can create a global human social system which is Gaia, which is not going to destabilize Gaia, which is going to promote biodiversity, promote human well-being, promote happiness, and promote our deep connection with the Earth. So what a marvelous time to have a conference on localization, because we're in a pandemic which is demonstrating for any fool to see that large organizations, uh, nationwide, even statewide over here, uh, doesn't have the capacity to respond 
it's, it loses intelligence and groundedness that you really want the localization. The world that is aching to be born now is a world where people take charge of their lives by linking arms with each other and working together for something they all enjoy seeing happening. I don't think that they will put up with that being taken away from them now by things going back to uh, business as usual where you're just a faceless number more or less and you're handed the amusements of the uh, consumer society to keep you happy. That message of localization is such an urgent and hopeful one. Uh, I believe whether we want it or not that the climate crisis and the ecological crisis will force us to live together and reorganize our societies in decentralized autonomous communities. And so the question really is how to make such local communities work and last, especially in the Western world, where we've forgotten to live together in peace. So as we each localize in our own contexts, this is also the time to come together globally to present an alternative to this monstrous system of corporate global capitalism. In the United States, we're seeing the grotesque incompetence of the national administration. And the positive leadership is coming from cities and states, um, you know, almost universally from, from the local. We need to scale down the policy. We need to distribute the resources to the more smaller sized cities or local governments from the mega cities. That is what I'm doing or what I'm suggesting. So resilience and self-sufficiency and collect, uh, the changing the relationship with urban rural areas is what the, now the big cities are trying to do towards the, to the local kind of economy. I think a lot of people are starting to realize that just giving responsibility to a few corporations for everything has left us all very vulnerable. And the question is, how do we take that forward? Because obviously the corporations already have power in those political parties and are often making donations to political parties. So I think we really need to raise questions about the power of corporations. Some things they do very effectively, they need to be regulated and we need to build much more resilient local systems. A stray alien wandering this ancient land So much of the dream that I still don't understand Been looking at you but I'd rather see you And follow the path of that old dark emu Someday my body's gonna breathe its last Yeah, I'm aware that this too shall pass But till then I'll keep singing to the open air Hoping there's time to advance Earth people fear Earth people fear Well I've been looking for the Earth people fear Perché dovremmo continuare a finanziare queste grandi multinazionali, queste big corporation, queste entità sovrumane che cosa ci hanno dato in cambio in tutti questi decenni? Falsi bisogni, intossicando il pianeta e tutte le sue creature, trascinandoci in un vortice di stress, alienazione, competitività assolutamente inscindibili dal modello globale. E nel frattempo schiacciando anche completamente la diversità naturale del nostro pianeta che è così essenziale per un'esistenza sana. If you are concerned about inequality, change the economy. If you are concerned about climate change, change the economy. We have a big problem in Spain and in the world of what's called the depopulation of rural areas. Uh, on the contrary, you know, cities have been uh, massified in the sense that, you know, everything is centralized in, in big cities. So there's a lot of incentives for global businesses to, you know, set headquarters in, in capital cities, etc. So rural Spain is being depopulated. So three out of four um, 
towns in, in rural Spain have lost population in the last 10 years, so that is dramatic. And so most young people are forced to migrate to, to big cities and there's a, a problem with pollution, there's problems with uh, overcompetition, there's problems of job scarcity with an extreme poverty, with energy poverty, etc. In, in big cities. I came to the realization that I couldn't just only work on a local level, that I needed to work with other people both on a national and an international level to push for policy, policy change, because otherwise we keep being trapped in this position where we are fighting kind of multiple monsters all the time. <laughs> A group of friends in Budapest involved in different activities dealing with sustainability and more social justice. We met and decided to launch an ambitious project for better well-being called Carbonomia. We would like to distribute healthy local food in Budapest with our self-manufactured cargo bikes. We get vegetables from our partner Jamboki Biokert. Jamboki Biokert is a 4 hectare organic and biodynamic vegetable garden in the village of Jambok. High quality vegetables are produced for families in Budapest and they distribute it in weekly through their weekly box delivery system. Jambok is also an open farm which regularly welcomes students and gardeners who want to learn more about environmentally conscious vegetable production. To enjoy these vegetables, we would like to add bread from our bakery partner, Pipach Bake Shake. Pipach is a social cooperative created by Yorgo. They make organic bread using traditional wet varieties. Their bread will be delivered with our cargo bikes all around the city. We bring all that food and also eggs, beers to Cargonomia in the city center of Budapest. From there, we distribute it to people in Budapest with our cargo bikes made in Cyclonomia. We are now locked into a system where our governments are subsidizing global trade and separating us further and further from the sources of our food. Every day, this global food system means that food is being flown across the world to be processed not just swapped and traded, but from Europe, from Australia, from America, fish is flown to China to be processed and flown back again. Apples are flown from England to be washed in South Africa, flown back again. Because we haven't heard about that, as we heard about climate change, the finger has been pointed at the individual. We've ended up trapped in a ridiculous situation focusing on individual small actions that will not save us. Focusing on this systemic shift to local food systems is the most radical act we can support. And we need to do it as soon as possible. I think food is at the heart of all this. Why have we become so dependent on other people's food? Why have we seen food much more as a cash crop across the world rather than a resource for good health and for feeding ourselves? And I think local communities have become poorer in the real sense because they're having their local crops taken away from them rather than serving the community. In and around Bristol there is plenty of farmland. Much of that has been taken up for recreational land, um, for rearing horses and other things, but 95% of the food that produced on that land is now carted away by the big supermarket chains into some big anonymous warehouse where it's packaged and repackaged and labelled fresh and then a week later is sold in a supermarket somewhere nowhere near where it came from and um, wouldn't it be so much better if 
the local farmers had the opportunity to work with the local communities to bring their food into the city as was traditionally done. And for the city to work with the local farmers so that the waste in the city ceases to be waste, but is a resource both for growing and for making things. I wanted to tell you about a plan that we have in the state of California. We want the schools to support the movement by buying the food for school lunches directly from the organic regenerative local farmers. We know that local is our future. And I have been doing this direct buying without a middleman, not giving any money to a middleman, giving all the money to the farmers and the ranchers who take care of the land, who are directly confronting and addressing climate change, and who take care of their farm workers. I want you to know that I believe these communities of people around the world who believe in the values of nourishment and stewardship are the future. Local is our future. So it's difficult to get the information that localised organic farming, if properly supported, could take care of all of the world's food requirements. Absolutely, and not only that, what is so hopeful about it is that we can actually, when we have smaller, diversified farms, they employ more people and they use far less land and water and produce more food. They're is anyone actually, actually doing this? It sounds nice, of course, a localised yes, farm sounds yes. better than Monsanto as copyright in seeds. But yeah. uh, are there examples of it happening Absolutely. anywhere? Absolutely. Like one of my favorite, I just made a film for a Japanese television, a Japanese farmer who was showed on about five acres it is that Japan could feed itself if it would go local and diversify. Globalized work, globalized struggle. This is our slogan within La Via Cambacina, a global peace and movement that struggles for food sovereignty, that struggles for land rights, that struggles for peace and rights, that struggles for building local economies and building local food systems. My name is Nelson Mudzingwa. I'm a smallholder farmer in the Shashi Agroecology School. I'm the national coordinator for the Zimbabwe Smallholder Organic Farmers Forum that is a member to the southern and eastern African region of La Via Gambasina. We are acting quite a lot, connecting producers and consumers, making sure that this time we have to provide local food reserves to the people, making sure that we have to build their nutrition so that they have access to vitamins. Local access to these vitamins is essential during this time of COVID lockdown. We are together with the global village to celebrate the achievement of localization of food systems. Some of the things that, that we pay attention to are what are the food sources in any given time? What's our, is uh, the fish, when are they fat? When are the, the good oils and nutrients that we need from the land, from the fruit, from the berries, from all that sort of stuff. You know, what is abundant at, at what time of year is what we're supposed to be eating. We're not supposed to be eating avocados out of season. We're not supposed to be eating bananas out of season. We're not, we're not here to tell nature what to do. We're part of it. And that's, that's not just a thing of the past. That's a thing that we, we should be and we are working towards being in the future. This, this whole game that we've been playing, thinking that we can dictate to the nature what it needs to be and what we want from it, it's a very short-term game. It's, it's not gonna last forever. We went from a situation where this area was fully populated. Today, most of the land is vacant. The grocery stores that we have are, are basically liquor stores. 
with, that have a, a little food in them that the food is old, 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 and terrible quality. Since we have so many people who need food, then it's only logical for us to use the land to raise food. The garden feeds any and everybody, from that person who comes down here every day in her Jaguar to the person who comes down here asking if we have any cans. Right. So any and everybody can eat, but the only thing we ask is, come get dirty. If you right. see a weed, pick a weed, and you can right. always eat. Yeah, I mean, people are looking for the garden. See the tomatoes over there looking good. Can I get a couple of those? Yeah, man, come on. If we want one to grow, we got to put water, seeds, and sunshine and water on them too. And the city of Detroit right now and this sign tells you we have over 1,500 urban gardens and farms now all across the city of Detroit. The grocery stores may have left, but the farmers never left. And through their skills, their hard work, their tenacity, they created 1,500 farms. And here's the key part, that when we grow in Detroit, we grow together as a community. And why do we do that? Because we believe that all Detroiters should have access to healthy, fresh, affordable food. Essentially in Detroit, we as a community decided that we wanted to be the change that we wanted to see as a community. We decided that we as a community were going to transform the city of Detroit. We our food lab, and we are going to build a local ecosystem of food entrepreneurs who are going to operate their businesses that are going to be sustainably, that is going to be local, and we are about to build the most delicious local food economy on the planet, Earth. <laughs>
we know Patrick that's growing the mushroom that's on that plate. To use the products in the shop and to sell them, but also to celebrate the Bristol food movement, which is amazing. Eh, tengo cultivo café desde hace varios años y he estado criando animales y cultivando este, toda mi vida adulta. Es importante eh, la localización porque es como la forma en que debemos de cuidar del planeta, cuidar nuestra tierra. Yo cultivo café para mi autoconsumo. Este es un café cultivado en sombra de árboles nativos. Y yo como productor y como agrónomo me interesa que cada vez más haya, cada vez más haya productores eh, que diversifiquen sus fincas eh, y que eh, vendan en el mercado local, que intercambien sus productos y que obtengan mejores precios eh, vendiendo directamente al consumidor y no enviándolos a el mercado internacional donde los precios se fijan desde Nueva York. There's so much that we need to really be learning from the indigenous communities in the places that we call local, that we call home, or really that, that we share as home. And in my case, uh, that was the Abenaki people who were here prior to us. And my hope is we can continue to go back and find the wisdom there and bring that forward as well. We have to be citizens before we're consumers because it is really as citizens that we change our food systems and our food sheds. And uh, consumers, uh, you know, that's also a critical piece as Michael Pollan and others say, you know, vote with your fork. But let's think about food shed as new democracy. Let's see if we can find ways to really utilize the forces of policy, you know, be it local, state, federal, you know, at the UN level, let's think about how we can utilize that policy really to ensure that those food systems, those food sheds are as just and regenerative as possible. I'm with the Land Workers Alliance and we're a union of small scale farmers, um, foresters and land based workers. So a lot of people who work on other farms as well. Um, we're part of La Via Campesina, which is a international peasants movement. It's a union worldwide for peasant farmers um, and land based workers. 70% of the world's food is produced by small producers, but only using 30% of the agricultural resources, where the industrial food chain is using, you know, 70% of agricultural resources to produce mm -hmm. only 30% of food. We feel that it's really important that we have local food economies where we, you know, have more of a connection to the people around us in our communities and grow for them so that you can really see where your produce goes, you know, and you can know the people that are eating your food because it's much more rewarding and it means fewer food money and really good quality food. We um, believe in agroecology, which is, um, you know, really focused on diversity. And really, that's a, that's a new term, but it just means, you know, looking at what's around you and making a, a way to produce food that, you know, uses the resources around you. And those traditional agricultural systems that people have fed each other on for centuries, um, you know, have been focused on the local environment and been super diverse, you know, full of all different sorts of varieties of crops, um, different types of seeds, different types of plants and fruits and, and livestock as well, you know, and those have all been adapted over, over time to be really suitable to the local environment. This whole lie of the Green Revolution has fed millions of people. Um, it, it transferred fossil fuel into food that killed people rather than, than um, fed them in the long term and, and changed dietary habits and, and, and eroded biodiversity. We have malaligned ourselves with Mother Nature herself. In fact, the fabric of biology on the planet. The consequences have been reaped most of all by our agricultural industry. Through chemical agriculture over the last 50 years, we've seen an explosion of chronic disease from our children, going from 1.2 to 52% of kids with a chronic disease in our country now, through our adults, through neurodegenerative conditions into the cancer epidemic that we see now around us. It is critical that we start to move ourselves into alignment with mother nature. The agricultural system has to take the lead as we reimagine a food system that is reintegrated, 
with a distributed and decentralized supply chain system that would allow for food security to come back into neighborhoods and communities throughout the world. この国の法律に対して地方がそれを法律で条例で跳ね返したところです。ね、これからさらに自家採集禁止という種が本当に支配されようとしている中、我々は地方から私たちの食と種を守る。それが私たちがまさに生きること。I remember when I was nearly five going to stay on a farm, a typical British farm in those days, animals grazing in the fields, hens clucking about the farmyard, hay growing to feed the animals in the winter with all those delicious herbs, clover and, and so forth. And then I remember going shopping in the high street, the small family businesses, the local greengrocers and grocer shops. And it, there was a spirit of, of community, of togetherness back then. And gradually, more and more land worldwide has been taken over by agribusiness, by industrial farming, leading to, to huge areas of land being cleared for monocultures. And genetically modified crops and because food is so often grown in areas that aren't suitable for agriculture they're irrigated by draining the water water is getting increasingly scarce down in the great aquifers and um, also polluted because agribusiness uses so much chemical pesticide and herbicide killing the soil poisoning the rivers as the rain runs off. And of course, there's also the animal uh, industrial farming, the terrible factory farms are being called concentration camps for animals. And so the big supermarkets are now gradually crowding out, squeezing out the small family farms, squeezing out the small family businesses and one by one the high streets are becoming dead as this trend goes on and on. It's desperately important that we take control in our communities of our food. Perhaps this is the exact time for the localization movement to really take off because we understand we really must start doing things differently. I'm bringing a little bit of a different voice of hope, uh, the voice from what probably most people think is an unlikely quarter to have voices of hope, and that's the business world. So when we live and work in the same community, we see every day the people that are affected uh, by our decisions, whether they're our employees or our neighbors or our customers, our suppliers, our, our environment. And we're more likely to make decisions from the heart as well as from the head. Imagine if a grassroots movement of local people decided that we could make and grow and invest in the goods and the services that our communities need. That jobs and wealth were better in the hands of the many rather than the few. That as manufacturers, family farmers, independent retailers, as energy providers or as community bankers that we could all just decide that it was all right to care for each other. Across the United States, communities thought that their pathway to prosperity was to attract and retain non-local business. And they've come to realize that this is a fundamental dead end. So instead, they are now working with their local businesses to nurture local jobs and helping those businesses connect with local markets. 
By redefining their economic problem as a local one, they've been able to take control over forces that previously seemed overwhelming. $100 spent at the local bookstore left $45 in the local economy. $100 spent at the chain left $13. So you get three times the income effects, three times the jobs, three times the tax proceeds for local governments. The principal difference was that the local bookstore had a local high-level management team. It used local lawyers and accountants. It advertised on local radio and TV. None of those things were true of the chain store. North Dakota in the 1960s uh, banned chain pharmacies. All of the pharmacies, essentially, there are a few grandfathered, a few that were grandfathered in, but all of the pharmacies in North Dakota are locally owned independent pharmacies. And we thought, well, that's a great way to like kind of study like, what is, if you only have local businesses, what's the outcome? Is it different? So we did a study a few years ago and took a, a close look at North Dakota. We found that North Dakota has more pharmacies per capita than any other state in the country. That if you live in the smallest communities in North Dakota, you're twice as likely to have a pharmacy in your community than if you live in the smallest communities in South Dakota. That if you live in the cities in North Dakota, that you have far more choices. You as a consumer have lots of different pharmacies to choose from. If you live in a city in South Dakota, you often only have a couple, you know, CVS, Walgreens. Um, and that North Dakota has among the lowest prescription drug prices in the country, and that they have better health, health outcomes because pharmacies are providing more health services. So you look at that and you say, well, independent pharmacies can compete. And if they can compete so well, why is it that they're disappearing in so many places? Let's create a fair playing field. Let's stop giving subsidies to big business. Let's get the tax code fair so that local economies have a fair chance to thrive. Let's stop using the farm bill to give 90% of our farm subsidies to the biggest farms. You know, if we go down the list, there are so many ways in which policy is working in favor of the big guys. And if we level that playing field, and if we recognize the various benefits that local businesses bring, I think we'll get very different outcomes. I wanna see myself as a part of the whole. Grow some food for my family food bowl. Stand my ground, but give up control. Know the boundaries, but tear down all the walls. Won't give up or give in to apathy. Gonna plant a tree, then plant another 3,000. Now's the time to start feeding my soul. Feeding the soil, believing anything is the best way of reducing poverty, increasing equality, is to go local. We also know that local businesses are extremely profitable. This is from Canada, and what it shows is the most profitable businesses have 10 to 20 employees. The least profitable businesses are those that are traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange. How can we get the 99% of us to start putting money into great local businesses? Because if we do, we unleash not only great local economies, but we take the fuel out of the monsters of global capital. In Nova Scotia, there are communities that are now allowed to create local pension funds. And there are maybe, I don't know, 50, 60 of these pension funds. In New Brunswick, they just implemented a 50% tax credit. Every dollar that you put into a local business above $1,000 generates 50 cents of reduction in your taxes in provincial, in provincial tax obligations. These are serious, serious reforms. We have started a uh, set of businesses that are worker cooperatives owned by the people working them that provide goods and services to these large institutions to create more jobs and wealth in the community. There's something about the design that I think is, is hopeful. People can say in Preston or in Albuquerque, New Mexico or in Toronto, Canada, well, we have large anchor institutions in our community. Maybe we could leverage them as well. We've engaged the Centre for Local Economic Strategies to go around the heads of all the main public sector institutions. The spend of all these organisations every year, it's over a billion pounds. So since then, we've shifted the culture, so they're spending a lot more within the local economy. 
co-op values and principles are very much about resiliency in terms of working. It's about democracy, um, self-help, uh, social re responsibility. And at the end of the day, it's because there are some people who are deeply committed and are fearless and are not going to be stopped. And that's how history happens. The familiar trend of globalization has been bad for people and planet, and it's inherently unsustainable because it depends on fossil fuels. As the world moves away from fossil fuels, we need to shorten supply chains and reduce consumption. This necessary shift from fossil fuels is our central focus as an organization. Coal, oil, and natural gas put millions of years of ancient sunlight at our fingertips. Our whole modern industrial way of life depends on them. But these substances are finite and depleting, and burning them causes climate change. If we build resilience in our relationships and institutions, and if we aim to maximize health and happiness within our local communities, we can minimize the impact of past consumption while setting up conditions for future generations to thrive. It's quite an incredible thing really to be able to save money myself but also know that I'm contributing to the local economy. Behind me, up in the mountains, there's a hydro that's making electricity. At the front end of me is a community, and what we've done within the project is match the two together. Energy Local is about local energy for local people for local benefit. It's really, really easy, but you have to start by talking to each other. Es indiscutible que en las próximas décadas tendremos que transitar de una sociedad agroindustrial moderna a una sociedad realmente sustentable, en el que los pilares sea la defensa de los derechos humanos, de los derechos de la mujer y de la naturaleza. Sabemos que el metabolismo de la economía globalizada es irreconciliable con la finitud del sistema biofísico, de tal manera que en los últimos 40 años hemos perdido las, el 60% de la biodiversidad del planeta. Estos son los problemas globales modernos. Cuando nos modernos globales problemas, cuando nos encontramos en los problemas globales, hay dos grandes cosas que nos llevan a la एक तो जो लोकल विजडम थी जो लोकल हमारा इंडिजिनस नॉलेज सिस्टम था और लोकल डिसीजन मेकिंग प्रोसेस थी वो सब छूट गई वो सब टूट गई और जब वो छूटी और टूटी थाउजेंड्स एंड थाउजेंड्स ऑफ कम्युनिटीज एंड इंडिविजुअल्स एंड कलेक्टिव्स फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल रेजिस्टिंग द करंटली डोमिनेंट सिस्टम बट सेकेंडली ऑल्सो कमिंग अप विथ क्रिएटिव constructive alternatives for meeting human needs, for meeting human aspirations without destroying the earth and without leaving half of humanity behind. The, I sit in a very uh, big place of privilege here right now as an indigenous person um, because I have a window into a very real life scenario <laughs> of people 
who think about things in a very different way. And we not only have shared knowledge, but we generate knowledge collectively, um, which is not something that modern world knows much about. Everybody's trying to have the best idea first and get full credit by themselves for it. But this is a very different way of coming um, to knowledge. That's one thing that I'm seeing with this localization versus globalization is like, you, just like you're saying, you cannot begin to see who is impacted from across the world. Ladakh se lam luksol shizrik tenna o changma tenne tendil nang las gyura la dupsi yot ganji gino hale. Tenna me spe lang na chik chik ladakh se jingbat. Ka ladakh se jingbat po khir tenna tenne pha mespo ne pha la tenne ma tendil chane jingbat chik. Kao se buchuk ne tang se na me cha chuk pa sirip nga mi chik po man pa tenne cham jige sem chan tham cha de pha Pantok Janjik, Mane, Natang Dances, a Buzik sort, Buzik Dances, a Pia, Natang sort, the Ratsu Lamanpa, Chikna Chica, Tente, Mahala, she say, Mane, Jixeneca, Spare Bushes, Jingbat Tendel Janjik in Tikto. So, you know, one fork is really a continuity of colonization, a continuity of fossil fuel industrialism, a continuity of the last 30 years of globalization. It's that line continuing with its. Um, Conquest, it's violence, it's monoculture. It's, I call it the mechanistic mind because that has been my work, you know, because I did my PhD in foundations of quantum theory. I've always rejected this mechanical way of thinking as an inadequate way of living in this world and thinking about the world. And on the other side are all of the amazing indigenous cultures that knew how to live without destroying the earth. They knew they were part of the earth. There's a lot of difference between the big boss and me. Mrs. Prime Minister and this young Aborigine. One thing's for certain and I'm sure you will agree that we're so different, you and me. So when you're in Canberra, do you really think of me? When you're in conversations of all your ideologies Just remember that me and my family are sitting on country Regardless if you're in an indigenous community, whether you're in a non-indigenous community these, these multinational agendas are literally taking control out of our own lives and dictating our future and not really allowing us to create the future for our children that we think is appropriate. Through social media, through technology, through education, whatever the, whatever the, the, the medium or whatever the source is, it's, it's redirecting Aboriginal people, Indigenous people's focus on what's actually important for them. And, and people are now obviously starting to become so consumed with technology that they're allowing, you know, Google or they're allowing Facebook to, to really, I guess, condition them, you know, in a way to behave that's ideal for these, you know, global agendas. You know, it's by keeping people distracted, they're not really focused on the real issues. The first rule of animal life is that you don't shit in your nest. You look after the place that nurtures you. You look after the place that looks after you, in fact. You maintain it, you repair it, you nourish it, you help it evolve and to grow. So the fact of a community nurtures peacefulness and community bonds. That is what holds places together. But if you're a company and your intention is not to nourish communities but to make money, you will use that community for as long as it works for you and then you'll move somewhere else. You will never have any further connection with that community that you left behind. Why would you bother to invest in it? You just take what you need and get out of it. Mutual help and assistance are most likely to occur 
in places where people know each other and have bonds with each other. In local communities, that is. That's the strongest argument for localization. We need to open up new ways of knowing that come from the wisdom of the land, the wisdom of place, the wisdom of the body, the wisdom of our relationships, the, the, the intelligence of love, um, and the wisdom of our ancestors and future, future generations. My uh, work in the world I see today is to kind of reclaim our cultural imaginations. And over the years of my journey, the last 25 years, um, I came to see that schooling, which has been propped up by the development uh, establishment all over the world by all kinds of great people to be a great panacea for the world, I started to believe and feel that uh, this might be one of the greatest crimes against humanity. When we look today, the way we look at slavery with the horror and disgust and disbelief, 20 years from now, we'll be looking at this factory schooling system and saying, how could we have done this to innocent children? Three years ago, we, create, we started to create uh, a global alliance uh, called the Ecoversities Alliance. It's right now 100 alternative universities all over the world. It's in 40 countries, uh, and these are all kinds of ecoversities. There's, there's forest ecoversities, there's eco-village ecoversities, there's transition town ecoversities, there's um, uh, real village ecoversities, there's favela ecoversities, there's um, uh, cafe ecoversities. So we're starting to redefine what it is, and we would like to challenge what is the university, who decides the knowledge that is to be learned for the well-being of human life, of life on the planet. In Thailand, the number of organic farmers increased, greatly increased now. But the, the number of old farmers who used to be farmers decreased a lot because they cannot survive in chemical way anymore. So no farmer want their kids to become farmer again. They send their kids away. But the number of young people from the city want to come back to the farm is increased. They have strong intention that they want to do organic farming. So uh, this is a new hope for us, because when they have good thinking, the technique is not a problem. Now we do a lot of training, mainly people from the city come, and many, most of them ready to quit their job. Many of them looking for land, many of them bought the land already. This is the chain I feel like uh, is exciting about it. Some things become clearer The end of my life is always getting nearer Focusing on the things that bring meaning Food, community, love and healing I'm getting tired of all this moving around Wanna bring it back home to a simple piece of ground Been talking about it till my mouth is dumb But all I wanna do is make a deeper connection with some We're not separate from the cosmos, we're not separate from nature. If we can find love and creativity and cooperation, they must come out of the cosmos that we're in. Where else could they come from? And it seems that there's a double whammy in the way the world is going at the moment, which is, is almost too painful to think about. And it's absolutely devastating that in destroying nature, we are also destroying ancient wisdoms which are inherent in cultures that can never be reinvented. Once they've gone, you can't artificially make them any more than once you've uprooted a plant. You can sort of say, okay, well, uh, I wish I hadn't done that. It's gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are people from whom we could have learned and who are being destroyed and driven out of their places even as we speak. In fact, one of the worrying things about this COVID crisis is that it gives the perfect cover for people to do things to nature unobserved um, that really would cause an outcry. And I'm very concerned about that, including trawling 
the seabed to find minerals for electric cars and mobile phones and, and, and so forth. As you were saying, once these cultures are gone, we're also losing with it biodiversity. So the knowledge about specific plants and adapted animal species and so on is disappearing as we speak. You know? So we are, we are talking now, as I see it, after this pandemic, this, the fundamental fork in the road is, are we going to go along with a continuation of that Newtonian mechanistic worldview when the majority of people on this planet have demonstrated that they are waking up to the remarkable wealth of indigenous culture, they're waking up to a great sensitivity uh, for the animals that are suffering in this factory farming. There's a, a very significant cultural turning that's been going on within the Western world in particular. To bring back our elementary essence of ethics and walk in earth care, people care, fair share epic. Now's the time to embed it while the temperature's tepid. Let us rise as a choir beside the people who get it to guarantee that our future generations' lives are provided the conditions they require to thrive instead of being deprived of the tools to survive in a biosphere too defiled to revive. So we invite you now to amplify the synergy Devise an inspired, distinctive soliloquy Combining with like minds an adaptable symphony Of radical simplicity, balance and symmetry Whatever your ability, we need your assistance In aid of reclaiming a stable existence Go summon your gift at this critical hour And deliver wherever they move and empower The economic system has to change. It's the crisis is, is is deeper, and I feel the shifts at a deeper level. The crisis is a crisis of separation, and a, a cultural crisis, a, a, a culture that is um, about dominating and taking, and wounds and narcissism and consumerism, and um, mm. that culture goes back uh, many centuries now but it's it's not the only culture that exists on the world you know there are other cultures and there have been other cultures it's a it's a kind of it's a mistake or whether it's a mistake or not even it's a thing that we did that we need to stop doing now the reason the economy is so centrally important is that it is what's shaping culture worldwide yeah and it is yeah. literally now shaping gaia misshaping gaia 25% of the FTSE 100 companies in the UK in the last period have used 100% of their profits um, on, 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 self, um, on, on, on themselves, you know, either bonuses or whatever. What that means is they've not put any reserves to, to one side. And so now they're begging us for a bailout, you know, because they've been taking their own money. And they've been making vast profits. And where's it all gone? So we are at a threshold, we are at a fork, and the fork says you're part of the earth, you're part of your community, you're part of your humanity. The other fork said, no, you're not part of the earth, and you're not human, and you're just our latest object for manipulation. And this is our ultimate moment to say, no, your imperialism of death is unacceptable to us. The first thing we need to do is rein in the power of big business by renegotiating trade treaties to insist that multinational corporations be place-based and accountable to nation states. You wrote this uh, for my book, didn't you? That I did. So, like, it's difficult for us to implement significant change because uh, on a national or local level because there are global trade agreements that prevent us from doing the things that Helena has just explained, like localised organic farming. Oh, that would be good if we all grew enough food and kept it relatively localised, but it's difficult because there are trade agreements that benefit, what did you call them, monolithic corporate cultures. Genuine political activity, the organizing work needed to protect citizens from the abuses of power, exists now only on the margins of our society. It means a rebuilding, pretty much from scratch, of local systems, of participatory democracy, and a re-education of what it means to be a citizen. This is a battle fundamentally about ideas. For me, the most important activism today is what I call big picture activism. 
we need to step back to look at this techno-economic system that from its very outset in slavery, genocide, misogyny, has actually continued in a very destructive direction, but far away, removed from our view. We've been blind to what's going on, even at the level of CEOs and government ministers. There is no laying out of the big picture, forcing people to see the connections between their idea of progress and growth and what's happening to the soil, to the earthworms, to people, to climate around the world. We need to step back and make sure that we educate ourselves and others about the functioning of this system and its impact. We have an opportunity like never before to bridge the divides between left and right, between social and ecological, between so-called poor countries and rich countries. We have an opportunity to come together and create the biggest movement the world has ever seen. The idea of progress married with the idea of human selfishness at our core is what continues the separation. And we now need to replace that with, with our felt lived experience of cooperation and altruism and generosity. That, and, and people who work in small groups uh, and work at a local level see that and feel that on a daily basis. The, the New Age community and a lot of spiritual teachers will say, you first have to do your inner work before you can do the outer work. And I think that that le- sequencing is a cop out. That yeah. actually by doing the outer work, we are doing the inner work. And both of those things are discursive and have to happen simultaneously. And we have to spiritually go within and really understand instinctively what we believe our truth is and not just fight for our community or the issue that's affecting us, but at the structural level, at the highest level, to create a new economic operating system that serves all of life. One thing we need to do for a whole load of reasons is to try to rebuild community, is to try to rebuild local geographic communities with local economies, with um, a, a local sense of social solidarity, political power vested to some extent in that community and from those grassroots we can then start to rebuild a national and a global politics. When you create local economies and build local communities there will be a tremendous growth in creativity, in arts, in music, in dance, in poetry because that's where the true growth should be and that's the kind of growth we want to see. Economic growth, economic growth, economic growth. This cannot go on forever and ever because there are limits to economic growth. But there's no limit to our spiritual growth and our artistic growth and our growth in creativity and imagination. The song explores the idea of localization through this question of connection with our ancestry here and now and what role this plays in our connection or not with our land. Living lines of memory drew the markings on my hand. Ancient lines of living love awaken in this land. Saying I am in the city, in the forest and the field. I am in the bounty, come on, know me as I yield. I am in the falcon, in the otter and the stoat. I am in the turtle dove with nowhere left to go. And in the moment of blind madness, as he's pushing her away, I am in the lover, and in the ear who hears her say, Can we begin again? People are launching a grassroots movement to dev- revive diversity. We can get humanity back using our imagination care for others, be active about getting information and searching truth on our own instead of depending on corporate media, and embrace diversity as we are all part of one big nature.
So let's believe that our choice at every single moment will change the future. I want to say a few things uh, just quickly about why this is a vital time to do different kinds of activisms, different kinds of work. If there's anything that this virus has done, it has exposed us to ourselves. It has exposed the fragility of power. Modernity is premised on the notion that power is far away, just like the sacred. It's at a distance. You have to travel far to find it. You have to travel far to gain enchantment. In a sense, power is always denied us. It's always at a distance. And that's so problematic in a world that is relational, in a world that is entangled and entangling. And if the pandemic does reveal anything to us, it's also the fact that things are much more convoluted, more mangled and entangled than we deem them to be that we do not appear discreet and uh, already made. We are being made, constantly being made. Um, so power needs to change. Our notions of power need to change. If power is always at a distance, then we will frame economics and the economy as food coming from far away. And we will valorize, reify, ordain, and celebrate a system that denies us the immediacy of our surroundings. We support Locally Locally! Um, totally Locally for us is about um, reinvesting in local businesses so that we can increase footfall, um, increase our revenue, um, and invest in Scarborough is an absolutely amazing place. Um, so we don't need all the big boys, we just need to do it for ourselves. So I would say that in the absence of an absolute universal rightness, rectitude, certain way, we must find a kind of practical interpretation of the way that we lived for many, many, many years to acknowledge that the city, the agriculture, post-agricultural or late agricultural, post-industrial models that we find ourselves living in now are not a good reflection of our nature. I'm not saying let's smash down cities and throw our iPhones out the window, let's keep them, but let's not prioritise the continual commodification and the continual advancement of uh, consumer goods as the dominant idea for our life. But only when we ordinary people, such as any of us are ordinary, have access to the decision-making means the true, to true democracy, only then do we live in a way that's a reflection of our nature. We've developed this um, very complicated system now, it's highly complex, and so to try and make decisions from a centralised uh, um, organ organisation or, or administration just isn't how it works. Um, and I think we're seeing that uh, a lot of pushback, a lot of people uh, pushing more to the right in their politics right around the world is this cry out for more empowerment at a local level. They're sick of these decisions being made by corporations that are thousands of kilometres away from their own region where they understand the nuance and what's required in their particular community. So the more that we can localise and give people back that power at that local level, I think we're going to see um, huge changes, not only environmentally, but also to the social fabric of what we're creating. Ma sempre più persone iniziano a comprendere che la soluzione nella localizzazione della produzione dei servizi per ritornare ad un'economia non soltanto più umana, ma che sia capace anche di una maggiore redistribuzione della ricchezza prodotta, evitando che confluisca nelle mani di poche persone. Il mio impegno come giornalista 
scrittrice attivista e di aiutare il mio popolo ad un risveglio urgente e necessario. Sono con voi con il cuore e sono sicura che tutti insieme potremo cambiare il corso della storia. The future will be more local. It yeah. will either be more local because we make the kind of changes we're talking about here and use this opportunity to do so, or it'll be more local because society will collapse. And when societies collapse, they become yeah. more local. For anyone who thinks that a new world will be born top down, they don't get it. Mm. Life grows from the bottom up and localization is where the new world will be created. Right now we are at a pinnacle point in history. We have two ways that we can go in this fork in the road. And I just ask that we stop, that we slow down for a moment and don't rush towards the technological future. That perhaps the answers are in the past. Perhaps the answers lay with our ancestors. And I ask that maybe we can change our idea of what success means, to not link it to monetary status, but rather link it to the health of the people and the planet. Thanks so much for staying with us to the very end. I hope we've given you some food for thought and maybe even inspired you to explore the global to local arguments further. I'm absolutely convinced that the main reason we're hurtling from crisis to crisis is that our global economic system is fundamentally anti-life. It's at odds with both nature and human nature. Surely, supporting more just, more ecological, place-based economies is the way forward. As you've seen, the localization movement is already underway. And literally every day at Local Futures, we hear about new exciting initiatives in farming, in finance, in physical as well as mental health care, in energy, in education. Yet these initiatives get barely a mention in the mainstream media, and certainly not as part of a cohesive movement for fundamental change. But because localization corresponds to the innate needs of both people and planet, it's an unstoppable force. Localization is where the flourishing of life begins. Support local economies, <laughs> eat well and do good. Happy World Localization Day. Je vous souhaite une très bonne journée mondiale de la localisation. Ouais. The beauty of saying, okay, we're going to localize the economies, it unlocks a phenomenal amount of imagination. Saluti dall'Italia e mille mille auguri per il World Localization Day. Buon attimo, tendeli la palestra. And I wish everybody the very best on this World Localization Day. Could not be a more important topic. It's a way of respecting the imagination of each place on earth. A Dutch network of entrepreneurs who believe in localization as one of the major forces for fundamental economic change. A more systemic and holistic way of understanding place. The World Localization Day suggests a very important message to the world facing climate crisis and pandemic. To think better about the future we want to create now. Happy World Localization Day! Right now, ring a bell.